Hello, I'm Dr. Joseph Ranieri, doctor of osteopathic medicine. My training goes back to the School of Medicine, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. And as an osteopath, we learn not just allopathic approaches to treatment of disease, but osteopathic manipulation, which is tied into the clinical autonomic dysfunction. Further training that I had was in functional medicine, which deals with uh, nutraceuticals, vitamins, supplements, and herbs in augmenting different disease states. Also, I'm a licensed acupuncturist. And what I like to do is um, ask Dr. Tapachi to give me a thumbnail sketch about himself and how he got involved in the nutraceutical market and as a form of wellness and health. Because most physicians these days provide medications and do not believe in nutraceuticals. Yeah, I would say, Joe, that um, uh, that last statement is pretty valid. Uh, first of all, I am a graduate of the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in 1978, so I'm one of the old-timer cardiologists. Going back to the uh, 70s, I got my MD degree in New York. And then I went to Philadelphia and went to Hahnemann Hospital University and obtained my internal medicine and cardiology training there. Now, Hahnemann Hospital is very unique among medical schools and medical hospitals because Dr. Hahnemann is the father of, uh, actually, uh, is a father of homeopathic medicine. And there was a little slant there towards me getting an introduction into maybe more isn't better, more medicine isn't better. So I started getting an idea about that. I started doing a lot of research at Hahnemann and the Heart Institute on stress testing and echo and published many papers. I have about 100 abstracts and uh, articles published. Uh, work with stress testing and ultrasound of the heart, but then eventually in the last few years got involved with the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. How the brain affects all the organs, including the heart. Uh, doing research in that with supplements, especially on how they improve the autonomic nervous system. And which is basically the connection of uh, special types of nerve fibers from the brain and the spinal cord to all the organs like the heart. And we call this the brain-heart connection to my patients because it's very important they understand that. Um, we published a textbook on this area about two years ago, Springer Publishers, uh, myself, Dr. Colombo, Dr. Aurora, and Dr. Vinick, called Clinical Autonomic Dysfunction, about 500 and something pages, and uh, it's in many of the medical schools and it's for physicians. But prior to that, I wrote a book in the early 90s, which I'm very proud of, with W.W. W. Norton, a heart repair manual, which is written for lay people, not for doctors. This book was the first book uh, that in the area that really, to my knowledge, started risk gratifying patients with a scoring system. Are they at risk of heart disease, atherosclerosis, and so forth. And it predated Framingham and uh, was a very good tool for me to use when I worked with my patients. So as a clinical cardiologist, board certified in medicine and cardiology, I also have boards in nuclear cardiology and uh, some, uh, some special certifications in lipidology, which is cholesterol, and uh, um, uh, what, what I'd like to say, and echocardiography, what I'd like to say is that uh, we see a lot of patients in our outpatient clinics in the Delaware Valley. I'm licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We see a lot of patients come in, our outpatients, and we treat them. We try to keep them out of the hospital. We try to keep them away from invasive procedures. So I'm not invasive. It's not to say I won't use an invasive procedure like a heart surgery or a stent or an angioplasty, but I'd rather do things non-invasively. And if I can keep them away from medicines or pharmaceutical agents uh, or minimize them, I will. Um, and that brings me back to Dr. Sir William Osler, who is the father of modern medicine. Now Hippocrates, we all took the Hippocratic Oath, was the father of ancient medicine. But the father of modern medicine was Sir William Osler. He was a genius. He was one of the four founders of the John Hopkins University in the hospital and was the greatest teacher of his time, was also a pathologist and a great diagnostician. And he had two famous quotes that he told all his students about in regards to medicine. I'd like to read them to you. The first one, he quote, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. End of quote. That's a little strange. The top professor of his era in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is educating his physicians not to take medicine. Now, he didn't believe that you don't take any medicines. I think what he's telling you is that you have to look at the patient and not just the disease, and decide how much medicine they really need. If there's alternative ways we could do it and spare them from too much pharmacology. It's not saying that you give them zero. And he also said, quote, 
The person who takes medicine must recover twice, once from the disease and once from the medicine, end quote, which means pharmacology does have side effects. Now, he also stated that the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So you treat the patient holistically. You just don't look at the disease in a vacuum and give them pharmacology or give them surgery or put some kind of intervention. Look at the whole patient holistically and see how else we can round out there and be a little bit more non-invasive. And he also said, gentlemen, I have a confession to make. Half of what we have taught you is an error, and furthermore, we cannot tell you which is half of it, which means that there's a lot of errors in what's being taught. And it gets changed every year, every 10 years. What we may say today may not hold tomorrow, but the substances in our body don't change. God gave us DNA. We make amino acids like L-arginine. We have alpha-lipoic acid, lipoic acid in our bodies, in our mitochondria. Uh, we have omega-3 fatty acids in our cell membranes. These are things that are not going to change because they're part of our makeup. And this is what I'm trying to focus on. How do we utilize some of these natural substances or substances the body uses since the beginning of time to help disease entities reverse them or treat them or whatever or help things out. Now, supplements per se do not treat or diagnose disease, so we've got to be careful about that. So some of the things I say here shouldn't be intended to diagnose or treat diseases. Basically, you got to check your own physician with your own physician. What he would advise, everyone's a different individual. But I can give some guidelines as to what I do in my practice, and you could take what you think is important and bounce it off your own physician. Uh, and how did I get involved in this field? Well, in the late 1980s, there was a brilliant fellow by the name of Tim Shields who got me interested in these uh, fish oils, these omega-3 fish oils, which you could see here. And explain to me, well, the Eskimos in Greenland don't get heart disease, uh, and they take a lot of fish oils through their natural diet and so forth, and he wanted to know why. So we did a little research, and we found out, well, fish oils help the HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol raises it, and it may lower the triglycerides, and we, I think we published an abstract in the late 80s on that. It was minor research in that, at that time. But the field exploded what fish oils can do, and we're going to talk about that at length today. So I think that's how I started getting interested, began with the fish oils. Now we're working with uh, substances that affect the C fibers in the nerves, the little, little C fibers that are in the autonomic nervous system, and using alpha-lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10 and so forth. And we're trying to learn uh, a lot more about some of these substances in our own body, if we can use them to help correct some uh, abnormalities that we see in testing results on people. So that's basically how I got interested in this area. Dr. DiPaci, I was fascinated by your discussion of the clinical autonomic dysfunction, something that I learned that osteopathic manipulation can augment and help patients with various ailments and illnesses prior to medications even ever being around. I'm also fascinated by your approach to wellness, and I want to know how your approach to wellness is unique over other providers. Yeah, that's a great question because what we do in this practice uh, other uh, practitioners may do it a little different, but the common uh, theme is to really take a six-point or a six-prong approach. We call it the VivaCore approach. Uh, and the first thing I like to talk about is psychosocial stress, something that's neglected. And we talk about it in my heart repair manual book back in the early 1990s. We know you can't measure stress. Like you can measure blood pressure, or cholesterol levels, or how many cigarettes you smoke, or how much you weigh, all risk factors for heart disease. You can't measure stress. So we have a little questionnaire we developed to, to measure stress. But how do you treat it? Because stress is very important to, uh, to negate, to ameliorate. And we like to use meditation, which we talk about a little bit, yoga, and the, you like acupuncture, which works great. And even manipulation, massages, there's a lot of ways. Exercise, but stress reduction is crucial to wellness. And we could get into how stress actually causes a disruption of the immune system, disruption of the autonomic nervous system, that brain-heart connection I was talking about, and also causes inflammation in the body where you get plaques building up in your heart arteries uh, and so forth, and blood pressure rising and heart rate rising and adrenaline rising. So stress is bad. So we focus on stress because that's one to six parts of a holistic approach, like we were talking about. 
The other approach we look at is the vaso plus approach. Nitric oxide is the natural messenger in the body. For example, nitric oxide, I think it was, uh, it was, it's NO, nitrogen and oxide, some people call it nitrogen monoxide, is the natural messenger. It only lasts a few seconds. It's, in the, it's a gaseous form in between the little cells and the arteries, and it communicates and causes so many beneficial things. It opens up the arteries. It, 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 it acts as an antioxidant. It makes the cell, the arteries bigger so more blood can go flow through them. It lowers blood pressure. It makes the blood more fluid and so forth. And we try to get the body's own nitric oxide to work better so that we can do beneficial things with the body. Uh, some people get better exercise enhancement. Some people, it can reverse erectile dysfunction, a lot of my patients. Some people, the blood pressures go down significantly and it can go down on their medication. It affects people different ways, but take advantage of the body's natural messenger. And in fact, in 1998, uh, a Nobel Prize was awarded to three or four researchers because they figured out how nitric oxide works and what it does in the body. Very important. And we work with L-arginine, beet uh, root extract, uh, and, and other compounds uh, that are natural in the body uh, that, that may enhance nitric oxide the way it works or its production, um, such as L-citrulline is another one, for example. Now, another third prong approach is the cardio neuro, and we call it mito, because a lot of this occurs in the mitochondria of the cell. The mitochondria of every cell in our body produces ATP, the energy molecule. And there's a couple of substances that are connected to the mitochondria that are natural, that are in the different biochemical pathways. And remember the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle and all these things. Uh, there's uh, coenzymes or cofactors. Coenzyme Q10 is one. Another one uh, is, uh, is alpha lipoic acid. And these are strong antioxidants that work right in the mitochondria that is part of our body. So we're trying to get patients to take them naturally or even to take supplements to augment that in them and, and see some beneficial effects. And in and, and, and further discussions, we can go into some of the science behind that. The third thing is the fish oil itself, omega-3. And we're going to be talking about that in detail today. Uh, the fish oil uh, or fish products we know are very uh, important for the brain. We call fish brain food, and are very important for the heart, warding off atherosclerosis. And there are two chemicals specifically in fish oils. One uh, is a 20-carbon uh, compound, another one 22-carbon compound, uh, EPA and DHA are their initials, that actually go into the membranes uh, of the body, into the phospholipids of the body, and, and help the, uh, the membranes and all the cells work better and keep the, uh, the blood vessels healthy and the brain tissue, the neurons healthy, and the axon sheaths or the myelin healthy. Now, the, the next point I was going to talk about is diet. You are what you eat. For years, we thought the low-fat diet was the best. Well, we know now that from many studies, it looks like the Mediterranean diet really is the winner. It trumps all the other diets in terms of cardio protection and wellness. And uh, this started actually back in the 1970s with the seven uh, country study, which showed the difference between southern uh, countries and the Mediterranean versus the northern ones, and how people that uh, used the Mediterranean diet had less heart disease, less colon cancer, and olive oil became a big, uh, a big player in that. And now we know olive oil actually prevents all the cholesterol in our body from getting oxidized and, and getting taken up in, in, the, in the vessels and actually helps the fish oils go right into the cell membrane. So olive oil is crucial in the Mediterranean diet, along with all the omega-3 and the nuts and grains and fruits and vegetables and fish and flavonoids like with, with some of the uh, grapes and wine and so forth. So that is a very important area of your diet. And then we have exercise. You can't take 20 pills to replace what exercise does. Exercise raises your good cholesterol, makes your blood thinner, keeps your lean body weight down, lowers your blood pressure, makes your autonomic nervous system balanced so that your heart rate can come down and get lower and better. So exercise does so many things that you can't find in one pill. And so we preach exercise and we like to get our patients to walk in a walking program with a uh, pedometer at least three miles a day eventually or to build up to that. So by really focusing on this, we believe that we can potentially extend longevity, prevent diseases, and so forth. Now, you may ask, how did I get this idea to really get aggressive in this area? 
Well, being a hospitalist in this day and age, a lot of times when people get very sick, we have to put them on comfort care or we put them in hospice because there appears to be no hope. And as a hospitalist, I would get very discouraged when I'd have to put patients into that because we felt like failures, like the system failed. Especially if a patient was 50 years old. If someone's 95 years old, they've lived a long life chronologically, uh, you could understand the body breaks down. It's like an automobile. But 40 and 50 year old people going into hospice and comfort care would, would, would tear my guts out. And so I say to myself, we've got to figure out ways to start preaching and propagating this wellness philosophy so that someone 40 or 50 years old, maybe he'll have to go into hospice or comfort care in the future, but I hope it's 95. We've got to think of ways to be more aggressive in uh, healthy lifestyles and risk factor reduction. So this is how we got this approach. And basically, this is what I teach and try to take each individual patient, see where they can fit in with this. Dr. Depache, most patients trust their medical providers today. They trust physicians like you and me. We have extended providers, advanced practice nurses, we have PAs today. Patients trust what we say to them and what we advise them. My question is uh, regarding fish oil as compared to fish meals. Um, what's so special about the difference? Okay, well let's start with the fish diet. The fish diet uh, is very important and several studies have shown that the higher the fish consumption, uh, the lower the incidence of colon cancer and heart disease. And this has been shown and even in epidemiological studies, you have a big uh, Netherlands study that was done, uh, it was called I think the Zupta study. Uh, about 880 people they followed prospectively, and there are studies um, uh, that have been done, the lion study, the dart study, big epidemiological studies have shown that fish consumption is cardioprotective and, 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 and in many ways, and people, and even colon cancer and other types of cancers, uh, it's very protective and they live longer. So there's no question in a Mediterranean diet, even the fish is a very important product. Now why is that so? Well, we postulated what makes biological feasibility sense. We, we postulated that it's got to be those two uh, fish oils in them, the omega-3 fatty acids, and later I'll show a diagram of what omega-3 actually is. But the omega-3 fatty acids, the DHA and the EPA, may be the things that are cardioprotective because they naturally go into the phospholipids and go right into the cell membranes. They make the cell membranes flexible. They make it permeable to different things that go in and out. They have the receptors work better. For example, insulin can work better on these receptors when the membranes are nice and flexible, where saturated fat makes the membranes rigid, which isn't good. So it makes a lot of sense. So then we started addressing, well, these fish oils, if we can simplify it, because people don't like to take fish. A lot of people don't like to eat fish, or they don't have time to eat fish or salmon. Uh, or, or sardines, or albacore tuna, or herring, or any of these oily fish. So how do we, 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 we get around that? Well, the, uh, some of the agencies uh, in this country recommend you should have two fish meals a day, and that's been pretty standard in most of the recommendations, the uh, different agricultural and health societies in America, and they're in the guidelines. But if you don't eat fish, we do sort of lean towards taking fish oils. And there's been a lot of studies on fish oils and omega-3 uh, being protective for the heart, especially, especially in the beginning of the century. We had the uh, GC Internationale study, which involved patients after heart attacks and showed that sudden cardiac death was decreased in that population. It was like 11,000 people. Good study, randomized, well done. And then there was a large study, the JELUS study, uh, in Japan with, I think, 18,000 people. That was a mixed study. Some people with heart disease, some people not, but they all had high cholesterol. That showed good effects. Uh, and, then, and then there were other studies that showed sort of neutral effects. So we started saying, well, maybe the fish oil are only good in some people and not in others. So I did a sort of review in the literature, and I looked at all the studies that used higher doses of fish oils, and they seemed to do the best in terms of giving us better uh, reductions in certain diseases such as heart attacks or sudden deaths. That's my own empiric observation of this. Now, how could it be that people in Japan who live in the inner part of Japan 
have lower levels of omega-3 and fish oils in their body and don't live as long as the people in the fishermen villages. It's because they're eating fish, so we know that. How do the Eskimos in Greenland not get heart attacks? Well, they eat the blubber from the whale, which, uh, which has uh, the fish in there that eat the algae and the plank plankton, and there's all that fish oil in that and, that, and we know that that works. But can the actual supplement work? We happen to think it does, and we think you need higher doses of it to work for people that are sicker. For health, maybe we only have to take 500 to 1,000 milligrams of these DHA and EPA chemical uh, compounds in these fish oils. But when you have problems with high triglycerides, you need to lower, or you have heart disease, we believe you need higher concentration. So, uh, I know there's a lot of big studies ongoing. I know that all the studies have shown one thing with fish oil capsules. They don't seem to cause bad effects. So you don't get a negative out. So either they're neutral or they're good. And I look at the ones that are good and are, are favorable, and I said, why were they favorable? You can't have one fish oil that helps you and another fish oil study doesn't. Well, the populations may have been different. The study may have been different. The bioavailability, the compound may have been different. But there's no question that fish per se, and probably the fish oils if taken in the right concentrations and the right subsets of people, will give you beneficial effects. You can't fight with epidemiology. Hearing your explanations, I am convinced that your paradigm shift for total health wellness is unique and not unlike any other cardiologist that I know. Currently, I'm a board certified in addiction medicine, and I'm thinking outside the box right now. With the advent of an opiate epidemic and the treatment of chronic pain, people are dying from overdoses from medications. Even the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, has incorporated wellness, non-opiate modalities, things like acupuncture, massage, uh, and other modalities in the treatment of chronic pain. My question to you is, where does, along with fish oil, uh, where does olive oil come in? I think of olive oil as the fruit from the gods. It's been around for thousands of years. It's also a uh, supplement that could be used, you know, for a treatment of total health and wellness, and it's comparison to fish. Okay, this is a great question, and we should take a little time to understand the difference between what olive oil is, what fish oils are. We may have to look at a couple of chemical molecules, so we don't want to scare people away, what saturated fats are. The first thing you said, olive oil, is that it might be the oil of the gods. I like that expression because it makes you think of Greek mythology, yeah. Neptune coming out of the ocean, and uh, longevity and prosperity, and that. Good, good analogy. And uh, the other thing I like to say is the fish oils are more like the natural anti-inflammatory, or they call them the membrane molecules of the body. So the fish oils are anti-inflammatory, and they go into the membranes. Olive oil has so many good effects that are antioxidant. Now, olive oil will get these cholesterol molecules and prevent them from getting oxidized so they don't become bad. And olive oil will get a hold of these fish oils, the EPA and DPA, which I told you about, and we'll make sure they don't get oxidized, and the olive oil helps push these fish oils into the membranes where we want them to go. That's why fish oils are a membrane. So olive oil sort of is a good booster in there. And now, what is olive oil? Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat, okay? It means that it has one double bond in it. Fish oil is a polyunsaturated fat. It has more than one. It has two or three or four double bonds in it. And uh, by double bonds, I mean two links between each carbon atom. And what these do is they double bonds make the molecules flexible. Saturated fat has no double bonds in it, like the meat fats, the lard, the things that really make your blood syrupy and thick and clog up the arteries, make the membranes rigid in the cells so they can't really have good receptors. So I would like to show you a picture of what I mean by polyunsaturated fats with fish oils. Now, there's omega-3 and omega-6. People say, well, what's the difference? Omega-3 simply means that the fish oils have double bonds which start from the end of the carbon atom. You know, there's alpha and there's an omega end of every molecule, so the uh, omega end is at the end, like in the Greek alphabet. And it's three carbons in, you get this double bond, and that makes it omega-3. And these are the fish oils, the famous ones, the well-known ones are DHA and EPA. And I would like to show a diagram of that, if I may. And as you can see in this diagram here, 
which is very colorful. They're very flexible, these molecules, and they bend. EPA has 20 carbon atoms. DPA has 22 carbon atoms. And uh, DHA, which we're not going to talk about too much, also has 22 carbon atoms. That's a, uh, a different entity. But the big ones are EPA and DPA. And uh, they have double bonds, which start at the third position. And you can see here... Uh, at the third position, you start getting a double bond over here, and this is why we call them omega-3. Now, omega-6 fatty acids, such as um, linoleic acid, has double bond in the sixth position. And linoleic acid is not really as good for you as an omega-3, because the omega-6 makes the blood a little syrupy, makes the membranes not work as good. We like to have more omega-3 than omega-6. Now, on a Western diet, you have more omega-6, more linoleic acid and arachnidinic acid, which are pro-inflammatory, really. Because you know arachnidinic acid makes the prostaglandin cascade go into an inflammatory cascade. So they're pretty pro-inflammatory. So we see those in corn oil and safflower oil, those things. We should think they were great, but they're not that great. They're okay, but you need a balance. You need more omega-3. And that's why fish oil can balance that. The omega-3 is very important. Now, in grains, we do get, or walnuts, we can see uh, an alpha linoleic acid, an 18 carbon, which is also an omega-3. Uh, and it also helps the membranes become flexible in the body and so forth. It can also be built up into the DHA and EPA. So you can, from plant sources, get some uh, omega-3, but the, they're the smaller molecules, the 18 carbon. You want the big guys, the 20 and 22 carbon ones, and that's where you get those from fish oil. And they go right into the membranes of the cells. They're called the membrane molecules, and they are anti-inflammatory. Uh, and by anti-inflammatory, I mean that there are substances in fish oil that actually, actually make prostaglandins that compete with the inflammatory prostaglandins in the body and can reverse inflammation. So when you talked about chronic pain, let's say, opiate addiction, people need chronic pain. These omega-3 substances are great anti-inflammatory agents. We use them in rheumatoid arthritis, for example. They're anti-inflammatory. It is the anti-inflammatory molecule. When you talk about acupuncture, meditation, and exercise, which is what we should be supplanting uh, pain treatment with instead of opiates, if we can, uh, these are anti-inflammatory modalities. Uh, so anti-inflammation is very important. And fish oil is, omega-3 is the anti-inflammatory substance we use in this program that we ingest naturally. Uh, when you take fish, or if you could take it in a supplement, at least you're getting some element of anti-inflammation, and that's important to this. Inflammation is important because a lot of diseases, arthritic diseases, inflammatory diseases in the colon, and atherosclerosis is a disease, hardening of the arteries is a disease of inflammation. And uh, the, your, your question is excellent. Go for anti-inflammatory methods, not just pain control with opiates. So I'm very intrigued about, you know, how you, how you explained this uh, and, your, and our discussion today. Um, you know I'm an avid fisherman, and I love fishing in the Florida Keys. But I do. You don't take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like salmon. So can you tell me about the salmon diet and the benefits of that in particular fish? Right. The salmon obviously is a great way to take omega three, and uh, uh, even farm raised salmon could be good if they feed farm raised salmon the right kind of substances that have omega three in them and not omega-6, and not saturated fats. The same thing with even meat products that, that animals that graze in Greece or in Crete, for example. Uh, if they eat, uh, if they eat uh, the right kind of grazing substances, they can get good natural omega-3 instead of if they're fed grains, they may have omega-6. So salmon is important. And salmon really reduces blood pressure because of the omega-3. It can raise your HDLs. It can lower your triglycerides. It has all those good beneficial effects. It's anti-inflammatory, uh, and, and we love to tell people to go on a salmon diet. And if they can eat salmon two or three times a week, that really is a great uh, quota to take in to get that omega-3 in your body so that you can balance out the omega-3 with the omega-6 and get a better ratio in the membranes of your body so the membranes in the cells are more flexible. But some people don't like fish. So what do you do? Well, the best thing we can do is tell them to take the supplements. Sometimes you've got to take them in high doses. And there is data to show anti-inflammatory beneficial effects with the supplements. 
and therefore we are not adverse to people taking supplements. We don't see a big downside. Now, some of the literature will suggest, you know, be careful over three or four grams. You don't want to take too much because you could bleed. Uh, the Eskimos get nosebleeds a lot because they take a ton of omega-3, and they take it naturally. So you can bleed. There are bleeding tendencies with too much omega-3, especially if you take it with other things, mm. such as uh, blood thinning agents or uh, supplements that are blood thinners, right. like Jinka Balboa. So you've got to check with your physician Absolutely. individually before you take any of these supplements. So you don't want to take too much omega-3 because you could have some bleeding tendencies with it. You need the right balance of everything. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that, to check with your uh, medical provider about taking supplements. I mean, it's a well-known fact that compared to medications, we overall feel that the supplements, nutraceuticals, vitamins, and herbs are much safer when it comes to side effect prof well, profiles, but not in themselves. We know that that could exist. Uh, my other question, we talked about the mind-body connection. We, know, we talked about the brain and the body, but I'd like for you to comment about, about the blood-brain barrier and how that's interrelated to fish oil and the omega-3s. Yeah. There's no question fish is brain food. Mom told me that, right or wrong? Okay. Yes. When we were good Catholics, that's all we ate. We're Friday we ate fish. Now, right. now the trend has changed. We're allowed to eat anything else. But uh, the, the fishermen, they had really longevity, especially in the fishing villages, because fish was very uh, pro-health oriented. Um, in terms of the, the brain barrier, the blood-brain barrier, when there's inflammation, substances easily pass from the blood into the brain. Toxins, that's not good. Viruses, all kinds of substances. So you want to keep the integrity intact of the blood-brain barrier. By taking uh, efficient, uh, sufficient amounts of omega-3, we feel that the blood-brain barrier is protected. They're anti-inflammatory, first of all. They get into the cell membranes and, and offer protection that the cells can be very selective in what they let in and out. And it's really an anti-inflammatory mechanism of how fish oils uh, beneficially or fish products beneficially affect and, and, and make the blood-brain barrier work better. Uh, also, the cognitive function seems to be better when people take a lot of omega-3. For example, nursing mothers, when they're breastfeeding, taking omega-3 uh, compared to ones that don't. If you see the omega-3 is high with the nursing mothers or they're even taking it during their pregnancy, it seems that the, it appears that the, the, the children have less ADD and have higher IQ scores in some of the studies. So they get better cognitive function developed because of the omega-3 going into the, the brain. Now there's two types of omega-3, the DHA and the EPA, I told you. DHA is mostly in the brain. It's a structural thing. EPA is more of a functional type thing. You need both. You need both of them in there, so you need to take both types of fish oil substances. But they do promote wellness and cognitive thing. Now the big thing I like to talk about is the myelin sheets. There are millions of neurons in the cells, in the brain. The neurons are the cells in the brain. And they're like computers. There's like thousands of IBM computers in these neurons. And they communicate with things called axons. And the axons are insulated with these sheaths called myelin sheaths. It's like the, the axons are made of glass, let's say. They've got to be protected so they get wrapped and wrapped up with this myelin, which is a substance which is very important, as you know. Because if you lose myelin, it degenerates. You can get diseases like multiple sclerosis, demyelinating diseases. As you age, they get wear and tear. The uh, wires get eroded. So you want that myelin to be healthy. And the omega-3 goes to that myelin, and it keeps them healthy. It's, a, it's an important structural component. So when the myelin breaks down, those sheaths break down on those nerve fibers, those axons, which make one neuron connect to another neuron and make it go faster signals. When the axons, uh, when the myelin starts breaking down, the omega-3 helps them repair and get them healthy again, the myelin. So that's another thing. So brain food, yes, fish is brain food. Fish oils are important for the brain. And, uh, and this is uh, an anti-inflammatory mechanism is crucial, we think, in that regard. So you already talked about a comparison of the various omega-3s with olive oil and the various fish oils. And my question is, what about the arteries and veins? Now, the this, is, this is an excellent question because I would like to take one of my models here and show you what happens as we age to our arteries. As we age... Our arteries in the beginning are nice and clean, and as we age, we start building up plaque. Here's a lipid core here, and it gets bigger and bigger, and eventually, sometimes the lipid can break through and erode, 
and little clots of platelets and red cells can close an artery off and hence a heart attack occurs. This process of this plaque building up is called atherosclerosis. From the Greek word atherosclerosis meaning hardening of the arteries. And the major components are lipids and inflammation in this process. Uh, what fish oils do is by being anti-inflammatory, they help keep these areas smooth. These uh, cells that line the uh, arteries, we call them endothelial cells, they keep them smooth. They keep the LDL cholesterol, the lousy, the L stands for lousy, bad cholesterol from combining with oxygen and becoming bad and depositing in these yellow spots here, just like olive oil can do that to some degree. And so they keep those bad cholesterol molecules from being oxidized. They keep, uh, they have substances in them which have been discovered recently that keep the inflammation down and keep the chemicals that inflammatory mediators secrete, keep those levels low. We can actually measure them. And we can measure actually the omega-3 levels in red blood cell membranes. People with high levels seem to have better function of these endothelial cells that line these arteries than people that don't. How do we know this? Well, in diabetics, we did studies where we put uh, brachial flow meters and we could see how the blood flows through the arm arteries and people given fish oils over periods of time and how that actually enhances the flow of blood. So we know that fish oils can affect very much these cells here. So fish oils help the brain, as I said, and they can also help the inner lining of the arteries, the endothelial cells. Again, mostly a anti-inflammatory mechanism. Now it's true that they are good for lipids to some degree, the cholesterol part of atherosclerosis. They lower triglycerides, especially if you have high triglycerides. Some studies showed even increased the good HDL2 cholesterol. They don't do much with the LDL, the lousy cholesterol, except they may make them a little bigger, a little more buoyant, so they don't stick as much to the artery. So fish oil really is not a great thing to lower LDL cholesterol. It's better for if you have high triglycerides taking it. But I don't think that's the major effect of fish oils on protecting the endothelial cells and these arteries in general. I believe it's the anti-inflammatory mechanism, as I discussed. Uh, and there are some substances they've discovered, like uh, I think Resolvin, or, or I might be pronouncing it wrong, there are substances in the fish oils that are very anti-inflammatory and very crucial. Now, the last thing is this clot down here. Fish oils and omega-3 whether it's from fish or fish oil, some of it's thin the blood and prevent these platelets from clumping together. They say, how could that be so? Well, there are substances that platelets uh, can produce called thromboxane. There's a thromboxane A2 that makes things clump together, and fish oils seem to, uh, to form a thromboxane A3, which sort of does the opposite, keeps those platelets from aggregating. So, uh, and a mechanism a little different than what aspirin might do, or some other blood thinners but like Plavix, but its own mechanism, uh, fish oils keep the platelets and the blood clots from thickening and causing little clots in the heart. So another reason why they potentially can prevent sudden death or heart attacks, as they have shown in some of the studies, some of the large studies, which were done, uh, as I said, GISA International and, the, um, uh, and so forth. Um, so that's how they keep the arteries healthy. We know that medications, in order to have a certain indication, have to go through rigorous scientific studies in order to get that indication. My question is, are there scientific studies with regards to fish oil and fish oil omega-3s? Yeah. Well, there are studies that have shown that it does lower blood pressure. Not a lot, but it lowers blood pressure. It's a vasodilator, so the studies show. There are studies that show that it, if you look at markers of inflammation in the bloodstream, they are lower in people that take fish oils. Or if they have high levels of fish oils in their red blood cell membranes, they have lower inflammation in their body and they have better reactivity of their arteries and so forth. So we know the fish oils do that. The question is, do they prevent stroke? Do they prevent heart attack? Do they prevent sudden cardiac death? Do they prevent um, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis? Do they prevent diabetes? These are questions that have not been solved completely. Now, we know that eating fish has beneficial effect on reducing cancer, reducing heart disease. How about the fish oil substances? We're doing a lot of studies on them, but there are some positive studies. And in, to my, again, my independent review, the higher dose of fish oils seem to do better. 
Now, even if you're taking a cholesterol pill like a statin, there was one recent study that showed if you took people out for heart attacks and you put half of them on statins with a fish oil and half of them on statins that didn't, or if you do a stent on people or an angioplasty after they have a heart attack, the people with the fish oil and the statins did better than the people with just the statins alone. So I'm not saying throw the statins out the window if you have heart disease that you, you can get rid of your uh, torvastatin or your ruvastatin. I'm saying that start thinking about maybe the fish oil may have a uh, augmenting effect on the way the statins work in some of these uh, these syndromes. And that's what we're looking at and, and, and we're uh, promoting that for health and wellness. Earlier you spoke about stress and how it makes such an impact on our health. I wanted to, if you could elaborate on the anti-inflammatory properties associated with fish oil and how that affects our body. As I mentioned, there are substances like resolvins and protectins that if you get inflammation, they sort of make the inflammation go down that the fish oils have in them. And we're the, so we know there's a biochemical mechanism. We know about the prostaglandins. They're more favorable that the fish oils produce that are anti-inflammatory versus prostaglandins like from arachnidonic acid, which is a omega-6, the omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Um, so we know that stress produces inflammation, which is not good. We know sleep apnea produces inflammation. Uh, we know that being overweight is an inflammation state and so forth. So anything we can do to reduce inflammation is beneficial. And if you do it naturally, exercise, stress reduction, eating a lot of fish or taking fish oil uh, consumption would be advantageous uh, to the body because stress is bad. It increases these mediators that are pro-inflammatory. It increases adrenaline and increases the sympathetic autonomic system. For example, exercise makes the autonomic system better. It makes you get more vagal input. Fish oil appear to have very beneficial effects on autonomic dysfunction and give you slower your heart rate and make uh, for a more vagal induced environment. Vagus is the brakes of the body. Sympathetics are the accelerator of the body and the autonomic nervous system has to be a balance of sympathetics and parasympathetics or sympathetics adrenaline and parasympathetics vagal being a one-to-one -one balance. If you have too much stress, you have too much sympathetics, too much adrenaline, too much inflammation, too much adrenaline, too much sympathetics, too much accelerator in the body. What you need is a little more braking action and that's where you need to rev up your vagus nerve and if you, it looks like fish oils and some major studies done by O'Keefe and others really with heart rate variability makes the autonomic system work better and give you more of that vagal input, cardioprotective in other words. And that's probably the mechanism like in GC International why fish oils and heart attack patients reduce sudden cardiac death. It's probably beneficial autonomics, not because it lowers triglycerides and not because it uh, increases blood flow, uh, but we believe it's, it, it, it could be an autonomic mechanism and I would not discount the anti-inflammatory mechanism of fish oil. So in summary, fish oils, anti-inflammatory number one, they're good for inflammatory arthritis. They're helpful, we believe, in plaques. Even carotid plaques have been shown to be uh, less involved when you take fish oil or uh, products. Uh, so they're anti-inflammatory. They're also vasodilatory. They make the blood vessels enlarge. They protect the inner lining of the blood vessels. They can lower your blood pressure. Uh, they're also um, very important in preserving the nerve fibers in the brain, which we talked about. And... Uh, and they're uh, very important in pregnancy and in, in the prenatal period with children. So a lot of beneficial effects of fish oil, uh, whether you take it naturally and we believe also in supplement form at the appropriate dosage, which your physician could recommend to you. Um, and that's why we put fish oil as a main component in the six-prong attack. Along with psychosocial stress and exercise, keeping the blood vessels healthy with nitric oxide, even though fish oils are helpful in that regard, and the Mediterranean diet with olive oil. Now, fish oil actually helps nitric oxide go up levels too because if you're going to keep the inner lining of the arteries healthy with fish oil, the inner linings of those endothelial cells create nitric oxide. So if they're healthy, they'll make more nitric oxide. So indirectly, fish oil helps the nitric oxide thing. In addition, nitric oxide will help the fish oil anti-inflammatory effect because nitric oxide has anti-inflammatory effects also. So uh, these all tie into each other. So you have to have a six-prong attack which is holistic to the patient and, ta and ta uh, you know, taper to the patient's needs. Your comprehensive approach is truly a major paradigm shift. Can you please summarize the Viva Life approach in the future. Yeah, I think that 
I tell my patients, look, if you stay on this program and focus on these areas that I discussed, all six of them, and stay on it every day of your life, for example, I take two fish oil capsules a day. I take the L-arginine and the beetroot extract, which is natural, as a form of nitrates, which makes nitric oxide. I take that every day. I take the alpha-lipoic acid, which goes into the mitochondria and the alpha-lipoic acid and the coenzyme Q day. I take it every day when I get up, I take it. I exercise every day and I walk at least six to ten miles a day. In psychosocial stress, I attempt to reduce that with exercise, with meditation, relaxation techniques, which I even give in my heart repair manual book. You use acupuncture maybe, or some other modality, whatever it takes, biofeedback, whatever modality you want to use. If I tell my patients, concentrate on doing that every day of your life, I don't care what else you do that's not harmful. If you read in Prevention Magazine, or if you see an infomercial two months later, or if you see an ad six months later to take vitamin Z, or zinc plus, you could take whatever you want to take. You could experiment. People love to experiment. And they go from one fad to the other. My patients stay three months on one thing, three months on another thing. Go to this core for life, this Viva core for life concept. Stay on that as a direct path, I tell my patients. And I believe you will get the most protection with your health that epidemiology, science, biological feasibility suggests. Is it guaranteed? No. Is it 100% proven? No. But... If I say it may do this, it may do that, it's got less downside and more upside. And that's how I look at it. If you stay on this core for life, keep your blood vessels healthy so you don't get rust on your pipe. Keep your nerve fibers healthy so that the myelin sheets don't degenerate and your electrical wires go bad. Uh, take your mitochondrial products so the small C fibers don't degenerate in the body and age quickly so that your autonomic nervous system fibers stay healthy. And diabetics don't get so much neuropathy down the line, potentially. I think you're doing your body justice. And don't forget the holistic natural approach. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Reduce stress, reduce stress, reduce stress. Everything here will lower blood pressure in and of itself by different mechanisms. Maybe if you're on three blood pressure medicines, you can get down to two. Maybe get down to one. Rarely can you get off of blood pressure medicine completely. It's hard to say. But... Each individual is different. Unless the doctor works with you, they won't know. But don't keep taking more and more medicines without at least exploring other options with your doctor. Talk to him first. And he may say, no, you have to go into pharmacology. There's no other recourse. It's too severe, this condition. Well, at least you've discussed it with him. Dr. Depache, I want to thank you for your enthusiasm, compassion, and educating us on this vital life approach today. Thank you, and hopefully we can come back. We covered the fish oil topic and the fish consumption today. Uh, I'd like to talk about the blood vessels with nitric oxide production the next time and how we try to uh, work with that and maximize that as much as possible, both with supplements and natural products and, and with lifestyle uh, techniques also.